Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to our conference on the trauma of communism. My name is Clement Sednak and I'm the interim director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies here at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. Let me please share a few framing and opening remarks. Our conference takes place within the context of the Catholic Universities Partnership, which was initiated by my colleague, Jim McAdams, who served as director of the Nanovic Institute of European Studies for 16 years. Jim built a network of Catholic universities in Central and Eastern Europe that would meet regularly to share hopes and concerns, challenges and successes. This hour conference was planned as an in-person event in Rome, but the pandemic has forced us to move to an online format, hopefully the last time. The experience of decades of communism in a number of Eastern and Central European countries behind the Iron Curtain and its subsequent collapse has left long-term consequences. Political frameworks impact not only individual life structures, but also the inner lives of persons. A number of categories have been suggested to talk about this experience. For example, loss of privacy, missing adolescence, an impersonal self, self-censorship, a permanent sense of fear, human compromises. Today, there seems to be a generational dynamics of memory oscillating between trauma and nostalgia. Our conference in the next three days seeks to explore the traumatization through communism. Communism led to the deprivation of political and personal freedoms, the silencing of certain discourses and even disciplines, the control of culture forms of epistemological violence and the suppression of religion. The private sphere and the life world were colonized by the system. Interpersonal trust was made difficult because of a system of denunciation and control. There is the trauma of communism, but there's also the trauma of transition uh, to post-communism with its rapid and deep social and ideological transformations. A reflection on the trauma of communism will also affect our thinking about the future of liberal democracies. The conference seeks to reflect on three questions. First question, what was the trauma of living under communism? How did people try to cope? Second question, what was the trauma of living during the transition? How did people show resilience? Third question, what can we learn from the ways people try to respond to the traumatizing experiences? The main focus of our attempt to approach these three questions will be personal experiences and eyewitness reports. Within this focus, we are particularly interested in the lives of Catholics, the role of the church and the responsibilities of Catholic universities. The contribution of this conference will be what we could call a thick description of the trauma of communism, an account of personal experience and the perspective of everyday life. Part of the background of our three-day online conference is a research project that the Nanomic Institute conducts with our partner universities. The project is called Faith and Freedom and explores the role of the church in a transition from communism to post-communism in selected Central and Eastern European countries. The project seeks to capture accounts of eyewitnesses through interviews. Here again, we deal with the trauma of communism we will have a specific student panel on this project on Thursday. I very much look forward to our three keynotes and to our panels. The keynotes are open to the public. The panels are more internal forum for our Catholic Universities Partnership. If you look at the program, we will have um, a keynote uh, uh, address right now, followed by a panel on the experience in Ukraine and Georgia. Tomorrow, we will have two panels one on Hungary and Poland, and one on Croatia and Slovakia, followed by a keynote by Father Tomasz Halik. And on Thursday, we will have a keynote by our very own Jim McAdams, followed by a student presentation on the Faith and Freedom Project and a concluding panel, Pathways Towards the Future. We intend to publish the findings of this conference in a volume with uh, Catholic Ukrainian University Press. Before we move to our first keynote address, I want to thank a number of people who have made this online conference possible. I want to thank all our friends from our partner universities, our panelists and our keynote speakers. 
I want to thank my colleagues here at the Nanovic Institute for their hard work on this conference. Monica Caro, Mel Webb, Grant Osborne, Jen Lectanzi, and Grania McEvoy. And I would also like to thank the members of our advisory board, and especially Bob and Liz Nanovic, whose vision has created our institute and has brought Europe so much closer to Notre Dame. Welcome all to our conference on the trauma of communism. Even though it's not an in-person event, we will try to make it as vibrant as possible. For a dramatic effect, I pause for 10 seconds before I move over to the keynote address. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Miroslav Frankovich Marinovich as our first keynote speaker of our conference. Miroslav Marinovich is vice rector of the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, a human rights activist, co-founder of Amnesty International Ukraine, and a founding member of the Ukrainian Helsinki Group. He's a true witness of the faith having spent more than 10 years in prisons and exile because of his engagement and convictions. His amazing memoirs were just published in English under the title, The Universe Behind Barbed Wire. In his foreword to this book, renowned historian Timothy Snyder writes, Marinovich chose the values he wishes to defend because he made a choice. He can characterize his own actions as a sacrifice, a suffering that was meaningful. The pain had a sense because it closed the gap between a flawed outer world and the values held by people. In such a pain, it is the sufferer who retains agency." End of quote from Timothy Snyder. Miroslav is in a unique position to talk about the trauma of communism from the perspective of one who survived the terror, who lived through the darkness, and who found himself rebuilding his nation after the fall of communism. We are very honored that you are with us today, dear Miroslav. Miroslav will speak for about 40 minutes. This should give us some space for Q&A afterwards. Please submit your questions or comments electronically through the chat. The keynote that we are about to listen to is entitled, The Reincarnation of Forgotten Communist Crimes into New World Evils. Thank you so much, dear Miroslav. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Clemens, for such a moving introduction. And uh, dear colleagues, it is a great honor for me to speak at this conference as a keynote speaker. And please be sure that that is not a standard and banal phrase. We former prisoners of the Soviet Gulag did not wait for a Nuremberg II to condemn the communist regime, just as the Nuremberg I condemned the Nazi regime. So today, speaking at this conference about the trauma of communism, I would like to say what my comrades would have said at the imaginary tribunal if they had not died in the camps or after their release. That's why I don't fall into banality because I really feel this is a great honor and great responsibility. The organizers of this conference called on the speakers to testify personally about the communist persecution. Looking back, I see the relentless crescendo of my incompatibility with the Soviet regime. A series of punishments for declining KGB proposals to become an informant, my decision to join a dissident movement, difficulties in finding employments, and participation in the founding of the Ukrainian Helsinki group, human rights group, followed by dismissal, provocations, and harassment by the KGB. Started from April 23rd, 1977, what follows, what arrest, interrogations, an unjust trial, the sentence of the seven-year prison term in a street regime camp, plus five years of external 
exile. The sentence led to long transfers in special wagons to transit prisons, long imprisonment in a street regime camp in the Urals, hunger strikes and strikes on work, hunger and cold on dungeons, searches and confiscations, and from April 1984, three years of exile in Kazakhstan. Even if you count without pre-trial prosecution, it is 10 years altogether. I was arrested when I was 28 years old. I returned to Ukraine at the age of 38, being at first pardoned and later in 1991 rehabilitated. And all this only for the action that the communist government considered a, a crime. The desire to protect human rights, including the right to criticize one's own government. This is what gives me the moral right to speak here before you. And I will base my further reflections on my thoughts expressed in the book of my memoir, The Universe Behind Bar Barbed Wire, just mentioned and just published of, by University of Rochester Press. So let's get started. World view aspects. I know in many circles in the Western European area, there is great opposition to the equalization of the Nazi and communist regimes. Of course, I will not deny that these regimes differ in many ways. Take at least this. It is still a question of which regime is responsible for more victims. Moreover, if the Nazis destroyed mostly foreign nations, the communists led to the bloody cavalry, first of all, of their own population. This conclusion, of course, is not a desire to somehow excuse Nazi criminals. The 20th century gave birth to two Siamese monsters whose heads grew out of the one body of violence. And any reasoning which one is better and which is worse becomes morally insane. However, it is important to understand how these regimes differ in order to understand the roots and causes of their criminality. There is one characteristic point. The Nazi happily wore buckles on their belts with the proud inscription, Gott mit uns. Of course, there was only one name left from God. But for the communists, such an inscription would be an insult because atheism was the basis of communist doctrine. The famous Bolshevik Anatoly Lunacharsky claimed, I quote, Christian love is an obstacle to the spread of our revolution. Away with love of neighbor. What we need is hatred. We must learn to hate because only then we can gain the world. The, the end quote. I remember one moment from my March 1978 trial. While attempting to justify my position yet again, I wanted to refer to a quote from Lenin that was relevant and would have directly vindicated my actions. I started, even Le Lenin himself said, and suddenly my judge, realizing what was about to fall, cut me off and shouted in his pathetic falsetto, do not utter the name Lenin. Coming from you, it sounds like blasphemy. To me, this is a brilliant confirmation of the French historian Alan Besançon thesis on the quasi-religious basis of communist ideology. 
The communist regime set itself the goal of destroying the Judeo-Christian foundation of European civilization. Therefore, at all stages of communist rule, the first victims were people of faith who were the bearers of morality and religious culture dangerous to the communists, the clergy, religious and intellectuals. That is why they, the whole hierarchy of my Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and the steadfast clergy who did not submit to the atheistic communist government were arrested. And in this way, society was cleansed of all those who in biblical language did not worship the image of the beast. Since then, communist ruled Eastern Europe has been inhabited by people whose spiritual world had been distorted according to new ideological pattern. It was both totalitarianisms in both, sorry, in both totalitarianism, a new type of man is created. In communist society, the type of Homo Sovieticus, for Nazis, the type of Ubermensch. The triumph of uncontrolled and excessive evil infected men induced currents of hatred and aggression in these men and strengthened the animal instincts in him. Proof of this is the paroxysm of violence which, which engulfed both the Nazi concentration camps and the vast Gulag continent, the entire territory of the tragic communist experiment. It was here that the words of Henri de Lubac were confirmed. The, I quote, the history of mankind has shown that man is quite capable of building a society without God, but this society is inhuman. The, the, quote, the end quote. <clears throat> From the point of view of the average Christian mentality, both types were immoral. In fact, as Zislav Krasnodemsky rightly remarked, both types were not amoral. I quote, neither fascism nor communism were nihilistic. Without the ethical mobilization of their supporters, and they appealed to their ethos, they would not have lasted long. Each type had its own clearly expressed, albeit biased morality. In one case, men considered moral what was beneficial to the proletariat, proletariat. In the other, what was beneficial to the Aryan race. In both cases, the new morality initially, it would seem, disciplined society, stopped the process of its degradation, and even filled it with a certain dynamism. However, quasi-morality cannot replace absolute morality. The only thing it managed to do is relativize it. Thus, in the case of both totalitarianisms, the destabilizing effect of the profitable logic turned out to be the most lasting legacy. Today, the winds have blown away the benefits of the proletariat and the benefits of the Aryan race. But what is left is moral is what benefits me. It was exactly this type of a new man that become the main Achilles heel of Eastern Slavic societies that broke free from communist captivity. It is this type that becomes the main tool and at the same time, the victim of propaganda manipulations by the Putin regime in which the Czechist KGB principle of social engineering has been reincarnated. Therefore, let the souls of all those innocently killed forgive me, but sometimes 
It seems to me that the greatest victims of communists were not those who perished, but those who survived. For they could survive only by giving to Caesar what rightly belonged to God. That is why the most important revolution that the post-communist world needs is a value revolution, a spiritual revolution. Rule of law. The replacement of God by Caesar influenced another substitution. Instead of the rule of law, the rule of ideology or the rule of the will of the communist party. This distorted the entire legal system as it turned critics of the communist system into enemies of the people or especially dangerous state criminals. It was this title that was given to me after my trial. In response to my ironic remark that for the Soviet government, critics of the system are more criminals than murderers, my investigator seriously confirmed, yes, it is true, a murderer kills one or two people, while you dissidents infect large masses of people. In such a system, the most important task of the average person is to survive. And it was possible to survive by launching the main values of survival, political and ideological loyalty, the ability to adapt in time to ideological changes, which was ironically called fluctuate with the party line, and also the willingness to harass those who fell into disfavor with the communist government. In the, 19, in the 1990s, the communist doctrine crumbled like a cardboard house, but the trauma it inflicted on the legal conscience of the communist ruled nations proved very persistent. Only those peoples who remember the traditions of civilized justice were able to restore the rule of law. However, as we see today, this trauma is still felt even by such incomparably more successful states such as Poland and Hungary. According to Hernando de Soto's theory, only those norms which are actually mentally close to the population take root in countries. This may explain why Russia and in part Belarus have in fact returned to raping the logic of law, while Ukraine, having got rid of the most drastic practices of totalitarianism, still suffers from corruption, conspiracy, and telephone law, from the practice of selective justice and political expediency. In fact, it is an imitation of the rule of law inherited from communist times. There are exceptions, of course, but they only confirm the rule as it corresponds to an unspoken social contract. Sometimes people know in their souls that corruption and law lawlessness are bad, but they do not see or do not want to see any other way to survive. Just as it goes in the proverb, a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. That is why they are trying to somehow adapt to the current legal disorder. But such adaptation is also a legacy of the communist regime. Moreover, by avoiding the fight against evil, the post-Soviet man somehow acts in its favor. Edmund Burke said that, well, I quote, the only thing that is needed for the triumph of evil is that good people do nothing. Therefore, evil must be stopped. 
And Eastern Europe will not overcome the trauma of communism until it opposes the solidarity of a corruption conspiracy with solidarity in upholding the rule of law. I want to believe that during our conference, you, the participants, will give detailed evidence on other aspects of the trauma of communism. And let me now focus on other important aspects of this trauma. Accountability. Before starting this section, I have to make some remarks. I would love to speak about the camar camaraderie of my prison friends and the nobility of sacrifice of those persecuted. After all, the chronicle of Satan's deeds is not as majestic as the shining traces of God's light in human beings. However, communism has not gone into the abyss, into the abyss. So speaking about its reincarnations, I have to make my voice more condemnatory than I wish. The aforementioned inability of political elites in Eastern Europe to launch a rule of law raises one important question. Did dissidents do the right thing by refusing to bring their persecutions to justice after the fall of the Soviet Union. At that time, the desire to start over from scratch prevailed. There was a hope, we will not persecute you, you will break with your past and establish democracy. In my essay, The Atonement of Communism, I even concluded, the crime of communism is the crime of Cain, who raised his hand against his brother. This crime is too great to be tried by a human court. Today, we dissidents must self-critically and confessionally analyze whether such an attitude was correct. However, in my opinion, another question is legitimate too. Did Western Europe rightly warn Eastern Europe against hosting Nuremberg II. I was personally persuaded by my Western partners, forget, do not stir the past, move forward. However, with weights on your feet, you will not go far. Europe has forgotten that crime is turning into the past only when it is condemned and there is repentance. Otherwise, the unrepentant crime returns with new tragedies. And all 30 years after the collapse of the USSR testified to the correctness of this conclusion. Impunity makes a crime attractive and a criminal unrepentant. He hardly respects those who do not punish him for the crime. On the contrary, he despises them because he interprets forgiveness as a weakness. Therefore, a just punishment for a crime is not a revenge, but the necessary removal from the public body of those seeds which are infected with violence. Without that, society turns into a large cancerous growth. It is this tumor that Eastern Europe has been transformed into today. We're less and we're more, giving birth to a new monster, the Putin regime. If this conclusion sounds politically incorrect, then let me remind you, the principles of Putin and his elite are deception, imitation, falsification, treachery, dishonest breaking of promises, cunning, aggression, violence, annexation, gas and trade blackmail, theft, contract killings. This enumeration can go on indefinitely, turning the usual principles of civilization upside down. 
but they are all without exception, the defining attributes of the reincarnated communist devil, which once again has ambition to end the, the rotten West and of course the rotten <laughs> in the West and become the founder of a new and successful anti-democratic order. The West is afraid of such a demonization of a government because in a world of usual conf conflicts, excessive demonization of the enemy is the main obstacle to reconciliation. That is why Western politicians are surprisingly dogmatic in applying modern politically correct win-win patterns to the Putin regime, stubbornly refusing to admit that they are dealing with a dangerous metastasis of communism that humanity has left unoperated. This takes us to the historical wrongdoings behind the 1945 Yalta Accords, the fall of Yalta. As you know, Putin has made victory in the Second World War a dominant event in the narrative of Russia's history, which no one has dared to scrutinize. However, behind the fabrications of this truly great conquest, lies the mystery of the greatest falsification of the 20th century. The 1945 Yalta Conference led to an immense injustice, a double standard in evaluating the criminal behavior of the two totalitarian regimes. The Nazi regime was publicly condemned while communist crimes were kept hidden for security reasons and were never held accountable legally or morally. The official European narrative of history became one-sided. The Nazi regime was considered the ultimate evil while communist crimes were considered a Slavic aberration from a potentially ideal concept, that of communism. In other words, who cares that uh, there might be some dark spots on an other, otherwise sparkling external facade? After all, they did help bring down the Nazi regime and the enemy of my enemy is my friend. As a result, the world heard of the suffering of the victims of the Gestapo, but it failed to pay due attention to all the pain inflicted by the KGB on millions of victims. The tragedies of Auschwitz, Treblinka, Buchenwald and Guernica became classic examples of crime, crimes against humanity while Solovki, the Holodomor, the Siberian uh, Gulag and the crimes at Katyn were seen as regrettable events which are best not mentioned. It was an irony of history. Apocalyptic evil came to be seen as the savior of mankind. So when the fugitive from the USSR, Andrei Kravchenko published in the West in 1946 a book, I Chose Freedom, with incriminating materials about the communist regime. There was a fierce uproar in Europe. France and Italy organized trials of Kravchenko for speaking out against the good Uncle Joe Stalin a kind of savior of mankind from the Nazis. The world would have to wait for Solzhenitsyn with his The Gulag, well, with his, the Gulag Archipelago to break down this curtain of silence. However, the demonic evil power at the core of the communist system had to sooner or later metastasis. The world had to reap what it had left to germinate. That is why today we seem to hear the heavy tread of death from Mozart's Requiem. 1991, 
a KGB pupil became president of the Russian Federation. And this was considered acceptable because no one in the world considered the KGB as a criminal and terrorist organization, as was done with the Gestapo. The year 2005, Putin called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And Russia's wounded pride began to resemble the wounded pride of Nazi Germany, humiliated by the 1920 Treaty of Versailles. The year 2005, in Moscow, the doctrine of protection of compatriots abroad came into force, which almost literally repeated the relevant Nazi doctrine. In the year 2008, Russia occupied part of Georgia and it, be, it became a fait accompli. Moreover, Russia vetoed the feather movement of Georgia and Ukraine to NATO at the Bucharest summit. In the year 2014, Russia occupied part of Ukraine and annexed the Crimean Peninsula. And taking into account the recent proposal of Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron uh, to speak with Putin, this also tends to become a fait accompli. In recent years, having met no strong resistance, the Putin regime has waged a real cyber war with the West, launched biochemical attacks in the United Kingdom, and brutally intervened into inner conflicts in Montenegro, Syria, Venezuela, and several other countries. And above all, Russia has openly declared war on the current world order. Well, in human history, every decline of the collective security system has meant a war uh, that has changed the status quo. It is clear that civilized nations do not want war. But nevertheless, this third world war is already underway. We do not want to notice it because we want to prevent nuclear war. However, the main weapon of the current hybrid World War III is a bomb filled with the fake news. It leaves intact not only the infrastructure, but also human bodies. Instead, it strikes human souls. It is a weapon not only of mass destruction, but also of deep penetration. It destroys the value base of society and its morals. For example, by disorienting people with the fake information, it affects the results of democratic elections and destroys interpersonal and intergroup trust. As a result, human solidarity is becoming increasingly difficult to achieve. Thus, the long forgotten communist crimes are beginning to pulse through current European history. And today they have matured into new tragedies. As long as communist crimes are not acknowledged, brought to justice and finally repented for, as long as the still looming legacy of the bloomy KGB is not brought be before a jury, any hopes of peace and reconciliation are futile. Perhaps soft power is indeed stronger than hard power, but to this point, all we have is deceitful power. Obviously, at this stage, any possibility of condemning communism is, as a Polish proverb puts it, the wishful thinking of a severed head. The West will try to avoid the possibility of a third world war at any cost, betraying their basic values and principles, but in so doing, actually they are bringing this war that much closer to their doorstep. Because Benjamin Franklin was right, and in his famous phrase, I will allow myself to replace only one word. 
I quote, he who is ready to give up a handful of values for the sake of temporary security deserves neither values nor security. Why? Because the formula dialogue at any price is too similar to the logic of the market. If the seller knows that the buyer will buy his project, a product at any cost, the price for it becomes higher and higher. And we have indeed been witnessing a steady rise in the price of conflict over the last decade. While recalling Franklin's words quoted, I'm not calling for war with Russia. I just want to remind you that it cannot be avoided if you take the path of appeasing the aggressor. Let's remember another famous word that by King George VI, uh, with which he addressed his people on September the 3rd, 1939, explaining why Britain was entering the war. I quote, we have been forced into a conflict for we are called with our allies to meet the challenge of a principle which if it were to prevail would be fatal to any civilized order in the world, end quote. The reincarnated communist system is exactly the principle that if one would be fatal to any civilized order in the world. That is why the world must accept the challenge of getting rid of the logic that James Sher described quite ironically, I quote, we the West are afraid not only of Russian power, but also of our own. We do not want to prepare for Russia's defeat without its consent. However, the question remains, how can humanity accept this challenge? I will try to answer uh, with this a counter question. Is military power the only power of the civilized world? Have we forgotten that values matter? Have we forgotten that the West won its main competition primarily when it turned to the values contained in the DNA of human civilizations? And finally, should we Christians passively watch humanity falling into the trap of military conflict, even though we are called by Christ to the value transformation of the earth? The least we can do is to reveal the nature of the disaster that threatens the whole uh, world. The 21st century can be successful if it brings all the 20th century accounts to a close and does not allow them to poison our world today. This requires a total spiritual catharsis that is not only bringing all communist crimes to justice, but also seeing to it what they are atoned for. Repentance is not necessarily a political act, but above all, a spiritual one. Its rules are unique. This is how Russian writer Vladimir Sorokin described it with regard to his own country. Repentance is only possible after a total shake up. It is not a medicine that can be administered. I personally think that in Russia, voluntary repentance is not possible. Before you can repent, you first have to get a good jolt. Only after you get a bump on the head and you rub it, asking yourself what you did wrong, will repentance be possible. In order to repent, you have to first see yourself from the side without any embellishments. We are not talking about a single person, about, but about a large country. The country has to see itself objectively from the side, then acknowledge its sins, and only then, after a major catastrophe, can it repent. Who will repent 
when everything is hunky-dory, the end quote. So uh, as the conclusion of my like, life experience, I had to develop my own version of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream. I am convinced that the day will come when what is currently unattainable will happen. First, communist crimes against humanity will receive their day in court and the nature of the communist evil will be brought to light. The illusions and temptations that inevitably lead to the sin of communism will be uncovered as with the sin of Nazism in the past. Second, Putin and his clique, along with their satellites like Alexander Lukashenko or Viktor Yanukovych, will be brought to justice by an international tribunal for their attempts to reinstate their previous uh, communist evil under new flags and for trying to destroy the foundations of Western civilization. All former communist countries, especially Russia, will experience their own catharsis and purge themselves of their communist demons, collectively acknowledging their mistake in supporting and celebrating the communist beast. Western Europe will also have to go through a similar catharsis because of its own infatuation with communism, which only supported and legitimized the apocalyptic beast that was raging in Eastern Europe. Fourth, after this shared repentance, the former communist countries will cease to bear responsibility for, for their bloody past. And fifth, only then will the blessed day arrive when spiritually cleansed nation will don the purified gar garments of communist victims and achieve that which only victims have the right to do, to forgive. It is only by collectively judging communist crimes that civilized nations can attain final victory over communism and thus transformed formerly communist bloody lands into places of true reconciliation and benevolence. These will jointly acknowledge their collective blame for celebrating this evil, and it will collectively pardon them for the evil they perpetrated in a state of communist delirium. Thank you very much. I have one minute left. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miroslav, for this inspiring lecture. And uh, dear friends, may I just hold the memoirs in the English translation here to the camera. So this is where you can read a lot about Miroslav's life, which he connected today with where we are in the 21st century. Thank you so much, Miroslav. We have about uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. And Miroslav graciously accepted the idea to uh, take some questions. Please feed them in the chat electronically. I already have two questions here. One is, um, Miroslav, what was the quote from Lenin that you wanted Sorry. to hear? Uh, repeat, yeah. re repeat one, one again. Yes. So one question is already here. What was the quote from Lenin that you wanted to share? And that was called blasphemous. I don't remember. Okay. I remember the situation, but uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, it was a powerful example. I think that's why the question. <laughs> then we have a question from uh, Father Slavomir. Uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski, who died in 1981, the leader of the Catholic Church in Poland for over 30 years in the communist times, was imprisoned by the communist regime in Poland in 1953. Their leader in those days was Boleslav Birut. While still in detention, Wyszynski happened to find out that Birut died. On the following day, as Wyszynski put in his memoirs from prison, he offered his mass for Birut. Miroslav, tell us, did you pray? And if so, how did you pray for those communists who put you into prison and wanted to get rid of you entirely? Uh, thank you very much for that very uh, interesting question and very correct question. Yes, we prayed. Uh, sometimes with words, sometimes without words, 
just appealing to God uh, and without expressing that in uh, certain formulas. Uh, and uh, this was extremely important for many people uh, living there because uh, only when I left the, um, uh, the, the prison, I understood how blessed I was during my stay there, I'm ref uh, referring to the blessed be those who are who per persecuted and, and so on. <clears throat> so, and let me give you one interesting uh, example. Um, when we prayed for uh, at the morning of Easter, in, a, in the year uh, in 1982, uh, we were warned by the administration that we will be all persecuted for that. We didn't care about, on, on that. So we prayed, we are taken to Karcer, to the punishment cell, and we decided to secretly smuggle uh, the uh, letter uh, to John, St. John Paul II. And we did that. Um, it was a miracle that um, the Pope received that letter and he prayed a mass uh, mentioning our names. Uh, so as you see, uh, praying creates uh, incredible uh, uh, miracles uh, in labor camps. Thank you, Miroslav, for reminding us of the power of prayer. And also thank you, Father Slavomir, for, for this question. We have a question from uh, Taras Dobko. What could be said to constitute a reincarnation of communism today? What could be said to constitute a reincarnation of communism today? And on what main criteria? It is important to define it as precisely as possible to avoid the temptation of calling any contemporary grave political evil a reincarnation of communism. Yes, I understand this is a good, uh, uh, good notice, uh, but at the same time, I don't care about ideological uh, aspects. For example, nobody speaks now about uh, the future victory of proletariat. Nobody. Ideology is dead, but not the system of values. The system of distorted values. This, uh, this is the main, the, the main specific feature of this reincarnated evil. Of, of course, we may say that uh, actually all these evil phenomena uh, just repeat each other in, uh, in, in the uh, process uh, of uh, mankind. But uh, for me, I, I see very clearly uh, the um, blooming light uh, of KGB uh, values in Putin and he wants to restore this, the very, very paradigm that was typical for the Soviet Union. Thank you, Miroslav. We have a question um, about Chile. My question is about um, Senator Pinochet. Do you consider Pinochet a similar terrorist and killer as Stalin, Hitler and Lenin? Because the organization Dina in Chile was committing torture and similar crimes. Yes. We, uh, um, I, I would like to say the following, that two totalitarianisms launched the long chain of uh, uh, autocratic uh, and uh, violent phenomena in many countries, in, in Ukraine as well. Uh, there was a, uh, they, you know, these totalitarianisms imposed the main idea violence is legitimate mm -hmm. to gain uh, our political gains and that's that's all uh, and so you see uh, how uh, 
these two uh, systems infected all other uh, political phenomena in uh, Europe. It seems to me that there was no country in, in Europe without uh, certain positive uh, adoring of uh, Nazi, for example, even in, in uh, uh, Britain. Before mm -hmm. the war, there was some feeling, oh, this is a, 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 an effective government. This is an effective way uh, of achieving our social goals. Thank you, Miroslav. A last question, and I apologize to those who still want to ask questions. Uh, it's from Jan Banners from Ruzhenberg. He asks, you said, and I'm paraphrasing, that probably the greatest victims of communism were the ones who survived because many times in order to survive, they had to give up their soul. You also mentioned that soft power might be stronger than hard power. In connection with this, I have a question. Some warn, uh, like Rod Dreyer, that in the West, especially in the US, a sort of soft totalitarianism is taking or has taken root. Do you think that soft totalitarianism could be worse for Christians than hard totalitarianism? No, I don't believe in totalitarianism as at all. Uh, I believe in power of uh, faith, and uh, faith that, that when person is uh, uh, committed to uh, to their faith uh, commandments, then it might look like. Oh, he is not. Uh, he doesn't uh, support pluralism. He is only one idea person. Uh, but no, uh, I believe in values as a DNA of uh, human civilization. And as soon as these uh, values are uh, uh, subverted, then we have problems. Uh, so uh, I would I would not consider as I uh, I saw this um, uh, du during pandemia that all oh, democratic uh, countries failed in uh, dealing with this problem. So authoritarian uh, countries were more effective. Wait a wait a minute. Uh, both totalitarianism were uh, very effective. Uh, if you read uh, Maria Erich, Erich Maria Remark, uh, the atmosphere in Germany before Nazi, it was total disorder. And Nazi brought order into society, transformed the country. The same was with uh, the Soviets, the communists. Uh, they were very effective. Sputniks were sent by, by this country. But where is this country now? Because it was based on the wrong values. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miroslav. And by saying that, you also remind us of the special responsibility of uh, the universities here. I just got the chat that I need to remind the audience that those from our COP institutions will need to migrate to the new Zoom link now for our 905 panel. To all the others, I thank you so much for your interest in our first keynote in our conference. Our next keynote will be tomorrow, uh, Father Tomas Alik on the church's experience of communism and post-communism in the heart of Europe at 11.10 a.m. U.S. Eastern time. So COP friends, please migrate to the other link. It is for me to say thank you so much, Miroslav, for a wonderful, inspiring talk. We thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts your experience, your brilliance. Um, don't forget to read Miroslav's book, friends. And uh, I wish you well, Miroslav. See you tomorrow. And our COP friends, see you shortly in the next panel. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye, my Thank down. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.